vs Cancer as its charity sponsor for the season. Set up by the Gunas Podcast, it is a brilliant charity raising money for leukemia and lymphoma research. Please help me to help them reach their fundraising goal by visiting GunasVsCancer.com and see how to donate or bid for some great Guna merchandise. Thank you. Pursuing and likes, but the ability to pass a ball is second to none. Like whether it's uh, to the left wing, to the right wing, or straight directly to the forwards, um, they're not long balls that he plays. They are long passes, and he said that um, he can literally put one of the forwards through with a sort of ping in a sixty-yard pass straight into his um, his stride. So that is going to be incredibly useful. Um, and let's face it, he's a massive upgrade on anyone that we've got. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased. Um, but one of the biggest and most important things about David Luiz as well is that he won't accept anything less than winning. He is a born winner. He's won so many things, including the uh, the league and the, the Champions League, etc., and um, he won't accept anything less. And that will be an infectious um, sort of personality trait that will rub off on the rest of the players in the changing room. And um, I'd say he's a good candidate to be one of the um, the captains. Um, and he will sort of really lead by example. And he will uh, be geeing everyone up and, and organising the defence. Um, but yeah, the, the will to win... The sheer will to win that he's got will definitely help the rest of our players because he's always a popular person in the changing rooms. I'm sure he's already mates with um, a lot of our players. He knows a lot of our players. He knows um, Edu. He knows Raul. Um, and it's all really positive. Um, I said last season that I honestly believed that Kieran Tierney would be one of our biggest signings if we could get that over the line 
and I still uh, stand by that as well. He and Bellerin, when they're both fit and firing on all cylinders, are going to be utterly transformative to our side. The way that they have got so much pace to get up and down the wing, they can run. Well, I, I, I've heard a pod, I think it was actually on the same podcast earlier, the Arscast one, which was a, a good one after following the uh, the transfer window. And um, yeah, Andrew on the Arscast had a um, I don't know what I can't remember what his name was, but he he runs a um, a has done for many years a podcast about Celtic, and. Um, one of the most Scottish sounding people you've ever heard. You've got to listen to it. He's, uh, but he was great. And uh, he was absolutely singing Tierney's praises. You could tell in his voice, the tone of his voice, that he was really upset to have lost him. Um, but he said he needed a new challenge. And um, obviously, uh, going through the conversation that Andrew had with him, he, he said that he's got absolutely no doubts on anything, really, to do with Kieran Tierney's fitness or ability moving forward to be able to adapt quickly to the Premier League. There will be an adaption period, there's, there's no doubt about that, but he will be able to do that. He's got an abundance of energy, he's very good at um, defending and attacking. He honestly said that he's a better player than Andy Robertson. Having watched him for many, many years, he's obviously going to be a very good judge of that and Scotland. Uh, so, yeah, that's really, really positive. Um, and the fact that he is a really good crosser, header of the ball, um, and creates so many attacks and assists, alongside Bellerin on the other uh, flank, that's going to do the same, let's not forget. That's going to add a whole new dimension to our attacking because I know that we attacked down the flanks last season um, with Klasenac and um, Ainsley Maitland Lyles, but they can only do so much really. And uh, I don't think Klasenac can cross at all. He does the, the cutbacks all the time. If he does try and cross, he never beats the first man. Um, and with people on the wings, with general, general pace and... Um, crossing ability and who can take people on um, it's going to be amazing when you consider you add that to David Louise's passing from the back and the new refreshed midfield that we could we could actually put out and, and then sort of running at defenders and putting through balls to the front three as well and also you know but potentially scoring from midfield as well, which we haven't had for, for a long time, then it's all looking extremely exciting because the front three, as everyone knows, is probably up there with the best in Europe. So it's very, very exciting. The one thing that we've all got to hope is that Emery is brave enough to adopt a formation and a pattern and uh, willingness to play in a certain way that will really work to our strengths because we are going to be, if allowed to be, going to be an extremely deadly attacking team. We're going to have all the abilities to do that. But Emery's got to be brave enough to implement it and allow the players the freedom to go and attack teams because we desperately need and what we've been lacking is the confidence and the swagger to walk into um, any uh, stadium that we visit including our own obviously as well and not worry too much about what the other teams are going to do to us but make sure that the other teams are going to be damn worried about playing Arsenal and uh, it's we've got to really push our style onto the other teams and attack them and make them sort of come off that pitch thinking what the fuck happened today and, and just literally be in a dip because we've attacked the life out of them because we're not going to be we're never going to be um, unless we get George Graham back a defensive team with a strong solid defence although it's a lot stronger than it was. 
and it's going to be a yeah, hell of a lot better when Bellerin and Tierney are playing. And uh, obviously David Luiz teams up with whether it's going to be Rob, a fit Rob Holding or, or Socrates. So it's going to be stronger, but we're never going to be that team who's built on a, a strong defence. It's just, you know, it's just not been us for so many years now. So we've got to go out and attack and really force our style on other teams. And if we can do that successfully next season, then we really could go places. But if Emery reverts the type and gets worried about getting beaten, you know, a lot more like he did last last year, um, then it, we're not going to benefit that these new players that we've got, unfortunately. So yeah, let's really keep our fingers crossed that Emery adopts a really bold and brave strategy because if we can go to Newcastle on the opening day of the season this Sunday and put on a really clinical performance and get a really thumping win that is going to be setting the tone for the rest of the season as far as I'm concerned and we can get our swagger back we can get our belief and confidence back we can walk into any away ground across the country with our chest pumped out Thinking you, you know, you you got to beat us today. You have got to go and beat us, and make them worried about us. Because if we can get that fear factor back of playing against us, then we're halfway there to really changing the mentality. Right, we're just going to take a short break, and we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. So let's carry on about um, yesterday. Uh, it was funny the story about Kieran Tierney when he got a call um, to say that we were going to seal the deal uh, yesterday and Kieran Tierney was up the park with his mates. That just makes me laugh a little bit because one of the things that this guy on Ask Blog said earlier the Celtic um, podcaster, he said that he's another one, similar to David Luiz, or my thoughts about David Luiz anyway, that he literally plays like he's uh, playing down a park with his mates as well. He's so enthusiastic and he could be another captain, definitely, 100% as well, and he could be our captain for many years to come. Um, I've, put that, I've said that several times on Twitter and I really believe that um, he's a real leader as well even though he looks about 12 he's not he's a, he's a unit and um, far more powerful than his size and uh, you know dictates really so yeah they've been down the park with his mates being given an hour to go home get ready and be at the airport is uh, yeah quite a story really and uh, shows how down to earth he is. But uh, yeah, David Luiz himself as well. I um, I think it's it's such a positive move for me because I've um, read on Twitter as well that it was a very reactionary deal. Um, we heard uh, about his unrest at Chelsea, and we acted immediately. Got him in. And the positive things about David Luiz as well is that obviously he's Premier League ready. He can go immediately straight into the team. He hasn't stopped training. He's had a pre-season with Chelsea. And he hasn't got to move house. He hasn't got to get used to a new area. He hasn't got to get used to a new country. He's not going to be living in a, a hotel for the first few weeks whilst he looks for somewhere to live. Um, Pepe luckily has found somewhere to live because he's been in a hotel and these th these sorts of things are important because pe players are only humans and we need to realise that and things in their sort of private life, personal life, family life, all these sorts of things can affect a player's state of mind so more things that can be sort of 
uh, restricted on on that side of things, the better. And David Louise will have no issues at all. I'm sure if he needs to start on Sunday, he'll be ready to start on Sunday because he's still settled in London and he's he's ready to go. And I'm, like I said, I'm sure he knows a, a few players already. So yeah, fingers crossed that um, he can get a start on Sunday. Um, but he's got lots of other positives as well. I mean, he's got amazing hair, as we all know. He matches Gunduzi. And he's famous. He's on telly. He's in The Simpsons. So what more could you want? Um, yeah, obviously it came out of the blue about Alex Iwobi as well leaving. And it, it's always uh, a sad situation when someone that's been at the club so long since he was a small kid um academy prospect leaves the team it, it, it's, it's always a sad situation and um we all had high hopes for him um but he, he, there's a chance he could still improve but i genuinely think that he's one of those that we would have continued trying season after season and um we could have been in a situation three or four years down the line where he really hasn't kicked on and I think it's we need as a team to be ruthless I've said this a few times as well and when you are ruthless it involves making some difficult decisions and some decisions that are going to hurt and um, getting rid of Alex Iwobi yesterday was one of those but it is for the greater good, in my opinion. Because we've invested a lot of time in Alex Iwobi. He's had a hundred odd appearances, I believe. And he just hasn't, unfortunately, cut the mustard. Um, and if we want to be a team that's going to be challenging for the, the title, we need to get rid of this mentality whereby we just keep hold of players purely based on the wrong thought processes. Um, we've done it for so many years now, um, being nice to, to players and offering them contracts when they were badly injured and out for a year or whatever, just to show sort of solidarity and that sort of thing is, is lovely but it's not going to make us a better team now Tim Stillman said something on uh, the podcast earlier um, which I believe to be the truth as well I think that in actual fact that we didn't ever anticipate getting rid of Alex Iwobi he wasn't top of the list however because we tried and tried and failed to get rid of Mkhitaryan and Ozil but we had no takers I do believe that Alex Iwobi was a victim of that to be perfectly honest because of the size of offer that came in for him from Everton um, and yeah I think that's what happened I think he was a victim of circumstance however going back to what I was just saying the biggest sort of problem we've got to get rid of as well is this mentality of Arsenal being a comfort zone and a relaxed club and players being able to get away with a relaxed sort of, like I could say, a fluffy attitude. And, and that has been rife through our club for, for so many years. And we did, and I've, I've we tweeted out several times at the beginning of uh, sorry end of last season I beg your pardon that we need to sweep out that mentality with a big broom throughout the club and the only way we're going to do that is by replacing the players that have that mentality instilled into them and um, bringing in players like Tierney and Louise and Sabayos and we look through, um, and there's a lot of the other youngsters, um, you know, Nelson and Saka, etc. And uh, the front three are not tarnished with that brush. We all we can see how um, motivated like Abamyang is for a start. Martinelli 
looks incredible. He's one of the most exciting prospects I've seen in, in many a long, long year. I really, really uh, rate him. I think he's got a massive ceiling. And I really hope he gets a few chances this coming season. Um, Nicolas Pepe will give everyone a boost throughout the whole squad, clearly. Um, they're all going to want to... But when you get a player like that in, they want to raise their own game to impress him as well on the training pitch. Um, to make sure that he knows he's playing at a great club uh, with, with great players. And it, it, just by having players like that and, and Louise in the team, it's going to give everyone an extra spring in their step and make them try that little bit extra harder in training. So... Um, We've got a few more to get rid of, but the good news is that um, across Europe, we've got a few more weeks to do that. So, fingers crossed, uh, we can get rid of El Neni and Mustafi. Obviously, uh, I'd even go as far to say is if we get a decent offering for for Xhaka, we take it straight away because Xhaka is basically he's got a lot of qualities, and I'm don't I'm not saying I don't like. Granite Xhaka, and he has got a good mentality, but he's just not suited to such a fast-paced environment because he hasn't got the fast-paced thinking, let alone being fast-paced. But he hasn't got that mentality to to be able to think quickly and act quickly. He doesn't know what's going on around him. He thinks he can just um, you know, have a good look around a pitch and calculate the best options for him before he actually releases the ball. But he, ha he has got that ability to, to ping a nice, nice pass out, as a, like a quarterback does. But we don't really need that anymore because we have got behind him David Luiz, who's probably an even better passer of the ball. So he can take over that. Um, passing out from deep roll. Um, so, you know, Granite Xhaka's role within the team is he's, he's not really there anymore. So, um, I've definitely taken offer for him as well. Um, and for me, Willock has got to be a starter in the team. I, I can't see any other way around it. He's definitely got to be a starter in the team. Um, I know he won't, though. Unfortunately, but I don't think that's right. Um, because if Meza Urzil starts over him, then unless Meza Urzil has been absolutely outstanding in training, then I can't see another reason for it because he offers so much more dynamism um, over Meza Urzil. He puts so much more work rate into the team than Mesut Ozil. He's more of a box-to-box -box player. He's got more energy. He's got more ability to run with the ball. Because although Mesut Ozil's got all the skills in the world, he doesn't really get his head down and just sprint and, and dribble the ball and run at defenders. He just It's not really part of his game. But Willett can do that. Um, and he's got that knack. He's just got a born knack of getting in the box at the right time, just like um, you know Aaron Ramsey did. And, you know, really frightened defenders, because no defender ever wants a, someone running at pace with them, dribbling the ball towards them. Um, it just scares the life out of them. And he can do that, but he can also, you know, put a clean tackle in and out-muscle players, and win headers in, in the centre of the park. And take up really dangerous positions just outside the box. So um, he's exactly what we need. And uh, several times on Twitter I've put out the fact that I really want the midfield to be Willock, Torreira and Sabaos. And I think that will offer so much energy, like I say, and, and youthful exuberance. But quality in the centre of the park. And I think it's going to be a big year for, for Torreira. He's, you know, he's, I don't know if can, I can say he's been overlooked with all the new signings coming in. And then he's been forgotten about a little bit. But I think it's going to be a real step up um, season for him. I do love Genduzi, um as well. Uh, I know that he's going to be sort of a, a 
there or thereabouts as well within the first team as a starter, week in, week out. And I do think that long term, he will be the Xhaka replacement as well. And will it be more of a Ramsey replacement, if you like? Um, but I'm really looking forward to watching Sabayos as well. Because from what I've seen, which is not a lot, same as the rest of us, but I was at the Emirates Cup and um, I watched all the matches for pre-season on the telly. And what I've seen of uh, Sabayos, he's, he's he's a very exciting player and um, I can't wait to see him as well. Because he is everything that Jack is not as well. He, he he's a very quick thinker, very quick with his feet. He seems to have three hundred and sixty degree vision. And uh, in the match against uh, Barcelona, um, that little shimmy he did when he went, he just left uh, two Barcelona players for dead when he was he was pretty much cornered, and he just. Um, yeah, just shimmied from one side to the other and, and took it round Busquets and just powered away. And that was just an exciting moment when you, you see players with an Arsenal shirt on doing that to Barcelona players. It was just a joy to watch. So um, I think it was, may have been the same match as well where Martinelli flashed it. He came in from nowhere out the picture and just flashed a volley just past the post and the, the best thing about that was which I'm sure Aubameyang didn't agree with but I'm sure he had a bit of a smile on his face um, Was that, uh, he literally took it off Aubameyang's toes and Aubameyang just sort of steadied himself and got himself into position to shoot himself and then Martinelli appeared like a flash and, and just volleyed it ahead of uh, Aubameyang and that just says so much about the guy's confidence and um, ability and he's got no respect for any sort of world-class players because he's got that mentality in his head and um, as I've said probably before and I've said it a lot on Twitter the run that he did against Fiorentina that we all saw from the edge of our box pretty much to right the length of the pitch taking it around to God knows how many players and that pace, frightening pace that he had, you know, in that move, he just put the ball wide, that was exactly like a very young, raw Cristiano Ronaldo when he first started at Man United, and it seems crazy to think about now, but he was getting so much stick, and everyone was taking a piss out of him, because he had all the skills in the world, step overs, and the pace, and the power, and but he had no end product and um, at the beginning, Cristiano Ronaldo. And he used to put it into Rose Ed and, um, or, you know, or just fire it straight at the keeper or whatever. Um, if he was crossing, he wouldn't find a Man United player. And uh, I think that Martinelli, that that bit in that Ronaldo, um, sorry, the um, Fiorentina game where he did that run reminded me of that all over. Um, but... To be fair to him, the you know every time he has had a, a shot like that, it's only gone just a bit past the post. He's not been hitting it into Rose Ed, that's for sure. Um, but with a bit more experience um, under his belt and getting used to the English game, he's got so much potential and I'm so much looking forward to uh, watching him develop because we've got to have a very, very special talent on our hands there. And, um, you know, the same could be said for Saka, who's had a really good uh, pre-season. I hope he's going to get a few games, but I think maybe a, a loan for him in January will be a good thing. Um, now, one other point I wanted to make as well about the young players and um, the fact that I wanted to keep Eddie Nketiah until January initially. Um and the rest of them. It's I in an ideal world, what I would like to happen, and again, I don't I, this ain't gonna happen obviously, but this is what I would like. I would like Steve Bold to take the under twenty threes team, including the promoted youth players that we've got in the first team squad now, like Nelson and, and Saka and Smith Rowe, Martinelli, etc. I would like him to be the one to take all those players and the youth team abroad to play all the early rounds of the Europa League 
I know it sounds a bit crazy, but bear with me. It would be a win-win situation all round, to be perfectly honest, because if we could leave all of the the genuine starters, the first team players, with Emery at home on a Thursday night instead of going wherever across Europe to play these stupid games. Um, they could just be resting, but also he could be preparing the team for the match against uh, whoever on the Sunday in the Premier League with a lot of time to do that in, re- in a relaxed manner rather than travelling halfway across the world. And the youngsters will be getting such good experience that will be bringing them on at the same time. And I really, really wish we could do that. And I know it ain't going to happen, like I said, but we need to play as many of the young, promising players as possible in all of those games. And again, something that's going to say is a bit controversial, but I, I don't care. This is how I feel. If we went out of the Europa League this season, I really wouldn't care. Really wouldn't care at all. You know, I'd like the the younger players to get a few games, don't get me wrong, and um, get through maybe the group stage. Uh, in the Europa League, so they can just um, get as many belt uh, games under their, under their belts as possible and experience. But if we were to go out early, I'd be quite happy with that because I genuinely really want to concentrate on the league this season because it's there for the taking. 100% is there for the taking. Um, none of the teams around us um, have, have been particularly special this transfer window, apart from Spurs. But I just still don't feel threatened by Spurs. I just don't feel threatened by them. I mean, I might be proven wrong with their new signings and they may sort of absolutely set the league alight. Um, I really hope they don't. But I can't. I, I just can't see it, to be honest. I don't think he's got enough new players to make a, a massive difference. Um, I mean, there's one thing that you know, I've said before, that if you continue doing the same thing with the same tools, you're going to get the same result. And um, their squad has been so neglected for so many years. It's just stale, the Spurs squad. Um, And I do think there's a bit of unrest behind the scenes there as well with Pochettino and Daniel Levy and, and so on. Even though they're backpacking pals, I found out earlier on. They went backpacking together. And skinny dipping together. Pochettino and Daniel Levy. I'll just let you digest that for a little while. I was like a little bit sick in my mouth earlier when I was thinking about that. Sharing a tent and... Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether I'm sharing a tent, but... Going backpacking with your, you know, your boss and uh, going skinny dipping with your boss. That's just weird. <sighs> anyway... I don't want to think about that anymore. Um, Liverpool are obviously going to be there or thereabouts, but um, I, I think I've explained my situation there several times. I don't think they're insurmountable, but they are probably going to be in the top two, but it's not guaranteed, right, in my opinion. I don't think they're going to be getting 97 points again, and I think we're going to get a lot more points than we did last season. Uh, Man United... But they're, they're a car crash again, aren't they? And um, I can't see Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Definitely, definitely can't see him getting to Christmas, put it that way. And I think by that point, it'll be too late to salvage their season either. So um, they've sold their probably only world... Well, I, don't, well, I don't, can't say he's world class, but their best striker has been sold and not replaced. Well, they've replaced him with a 17-year-old who may well go on to great things, but... To put the, all of the hope of the Manchester United machine on a 17-year-old's shoulders is just m- mental. Their midfield is very weak. Very, very weak. And they're going nowhere. And Chelsea... They're, they're a decent team still. But under Frank Lampard, I, I cannot see them getting in the top four. Uh, I, and I think they'll be very... Struggling to get in the top six. I really do. Um, you know, they've got Tammy Wynette paying up front. So, 
So there, so I think we've, we've really got to put so much effort and concentration and belief into the league this season. So if we go out all the cups, early doors, I'll be really happy with that. Um, the less games we have to play, the better um, at the end of the day. So let me know what you think about that. Send me an email on um, from dial square to where at gmail.com. If you're watching this on YouTube, put a comment below and make sure you subscribe and press the notification bell, please. That really helps. Um, whatever podcast platform you're listening on, please make sure that you, um, if you if you can, give us a rating and make sure you follow us. Uh, I'll be really, really grateful. Please spread this podcast around with the, any of your friends and family who are gooners and uh, I'd really appreciate that as well. Thank you. I'm going to have another break. Now that is double naughty. Right, well, coming to the last part of the podcast now, I think massive credit has to go to the club um, for this transfer window. I think uh, the godfather, Raul, Raul's got, I think got to have a statue outside the stadium with all that work he's done it's incredible what he's pulled out this this season in the transfer window taking all that responsibility on and I think he has delivered and then some to be perfectly honest we've all had a bit of a laugh on Twitter with all these uh, Raul memes and tweets about him um, some very funny uh, pictures put up um, on there and I think he's He's just done us proud, isn't he? Um, I don't think Edu had too much to do with it, but I'm sure he's uh, had a, given him a lot of help uh, behind the scenes. And I know that it well, I don't know, but I'm sure he must have had something to do with bringing in David Silver on uh, David, David Silver, <laughs> David Louise. Sorry, yeah, that'd have been nice, wouldn't it, if he brought in David Silver as well? But I'm really, really pleased that we didn't get Coutinho, by the way, as well. I've heard so many bad stories about him. I think we've lumbered with, you know, everything that's gone on. I'm really hoping for more from him this season, Mr. Ozil, but we've been lumbered with, you know, his performances over the last uh, couple of seasons and his salary around our necks and the sulking and the just sort of couldn't care less attitude um, a lot of the time. And I think Coutinho in some ways would mirror that I think he'd be on a massive salary he'd be very very inconsistent and I think would be genuinely pulling our hair out and the the thing is as well he would also just be taking up a squad place for one of our promising youngsters and everyone will probably say come back as oh he, they, you know he's much better than them well maybe in flashes he is but he would not excite me as much as seeing one of our youngsters on the pitch trying their hearts out and showing their skills and and blooming into a, a great player in front of our eyes, one of our academy products. That would be far more exciting and um, rewarding for me and I'm sure you know a lot of others. And to have someone like that who would just come to us just because they wanted to get out of the club that they're in and get a big salary. And we would have been put on the spot. From what I read, it was 12 million quid to loan him. And then we were going to be forced to buy him for 88 million quid. So no way. No, 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 no. Um, I'm so glad that didn't go through. But um, yeah, David Louise, I'm sure Edu had a bit of a hand in it. Because um, he came. David Louise came out and said that he knew Edu as well. So maybe that uh, was the call that went in as soon as we heard that he was unsettled. But that's another reason why uh, Chelsea ain't going to be any, get going anywhere because David Luiz started 30-something matches for Chelsea last season and he had a really good season. And to just discard a player like that just to show who's boss... <sighs> It's just stupid in lots of ways because he was a very, very popular player in the changing room. And Frank Lampard is as well. I'm, I, I'm not stupid. He's, I know that he's a legend at, um, at Chelsea. But 
sometimes you can just cut your nose off to spite your face and I think he's made a bit of a mistake there and to let him join us of all teams is just a bit crazy so we've actually weakened Chelsea there's no two ways about it we've weakened them and they've strengthened us and they are uh, you know they a direct rival um going on last season for the top four and that is one of the reasons why I don't think they're going to even get, possibly, a, might get top six, but I think they'd do well to get sixth, to be perfectly honest, under Frank Lampard. So we'll see. Now, um, lastly, I've got an idea about um, something that I want your thoughts and comments about, if, if possible, please. That'd be great. Um, I'm thinking about doing a live questions and answers youtube show which is nothing new obviously everyone does it i'm not going to be <laughs> you know doing anything different there however i am going to do something different with it because i'm planning on doing it for a you know a, well i don't i'm not going to set a, a specific time limit on the show but I, what i want is if we can get as many viewers as possible commenting under the video I am then going to be giving the person who has entertained me with their comments and has been the most interesting with their comments I'm going to give them the last 15 minutes on the show with me so and they and, and not just to be um, a Q&A directly between the two people me and the, the winner of the the show if you like but that person can answer questions that are coming up uh, from the viewers as well and um, that come up on the screen so if you would like to see that and have an opportunity of being a co-host on the YouTube channel with me um, for the last part of a, a show then let me know um, if you like that idea then please uh, comment um, either on the email or as I gave you earlier from dial square to where at gmail.com send me a tweet which is at from dial square same on Instagram which I don't look at very often to be perfectly honest so I'll just probably stick to the Twitter uh, and let me know what you think see if that's a good idea so I'm going to call it a day there it's um, about one o'clock in the morning I'm knackered um, there's no crack of dawn today because she's out. She's left me all on my own. She's gone out on the booze with her mates. So I'm all at home alone, not Macaulay Culkin. So I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to splash my face with some aftershave and scream. So until next episode, speak to you soon. Take care. Bye bye.